Community Cats podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats podcast. I am your host, Stacey LeBaron. I have been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. Today, we are speaking with Deborah Shutt. Deborah is chair and one of the founders of the Michigan Pet Fund Alliance. She's an urban planner by profession. After 21 years working for the public sector, she established her own consulting firm 19 years ago, working out of her home, which allowed her to volunteer as a foster parent for puppies. As she became more familiar and more involved with animal welfare, Deborah became acutely aware of the lack of planning, collaboration, and use of systematic approaches, which were successfully used in other areas of her profession, to solve and address problems and issues in animal welfare. She became convinced that animal homelessness in Michigan could be solved, including saving the more than 118,000 animals annually euthanized in shelters if a different approach was taken. Since the Michigan Pet Fund Alliance has been providing information on best practices and supporting advocacy, Michigan shelters have reduced the number of animals euthanized annually in shelters to 27,250. Deborah, I want to uh, welcome you to the show today. Thank you so much, Stacy. It's great to be with you. You have a fantastic background and one that I'm very interested in. And as I was mentioning earlier, I uh, did some training in urban planning in my early days. I originally had wanted to be an architect, but then I moved into urban planning for a while. And then even some nonprofit management skills, which is interesting how the two professions uh, integrate with one another. But I was wondering if you could tell us uh, how you got started getting involved with community cats. Community cats were actually part of more of an effort of looking at the sheltering system. And so as I, as you mentioned in the bio, decided that once I started my own business, I wanted to own a dog. And funny as it is, I was not young. I'm not young now. (laughs) But I went, Hmm, I'm not married, I don't have children, and I've never been responsible for another living being. Am I mature enough? Of course, I was well into my 40s. <laughs> but I didn't know if I was or not. So that's when I started, the, you know what, I'm going to try fostering. And so I fostered, and then that's when kind of what started the whole Michigan Pet Fund Alliance, because I could see what was happening in shelters. And funny as, I mean, this might sound really silly because I was well into my 40s, maybe into my 50s before I even knew what a feral cat was. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I actually went to a best friends conference in Utah to learn more about sheltering animal welfare and the the entire topics. And uh, they were talking about how the hotel I was living with had a feral colony on site, and they were going to work with the management to trap and neuter them and then put them back into the colony. And I'm like, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. (laughs) I just always thought when I saw a a cat wandering that that's somebody's cat who's wandering. (laughs) That's how I kind of got involved in understanding, then uh, getting more intimately involved in looking at sheltering and what was happening Of course, so many of the shelters were trapping and killing, and that didn't seem right to me. Getting more involved in understanding what were different approaches, that's when it's like, ah, I learned about TNR, have since then learned about SNR, and it really is part of a comprehensive approach to the whole homeless animal dilemma whether the uh, cats are feral or whether they're community cats or whatever. I always reference uh, having the magical toolkit of different programs needed in order to be successful in your community. So expand a little bit more on that. On the toolkit, well, uh, one of, uh, and I'm a big proponent of education, (laughs) attending conferences for me and understanding what other people are doing and adding to the toolkit was really important. We work 
directly with one shelter for a time being and actually started a TNR program with the shelter and from that TNR and, and we're very fortunate to get a PetSmart Charities grant to be able to do that. But it wasn't done in any kind of systematic way. We attended conferences and then understood more at the conferences that I was attending, which were the no-kill conferences, that there really is a number of programs for shelters to, uh, matter of fact, 11 of them, that need to be implemented in order for a, a shelter to arrive at a no-kill status, which normally is defined as saving 90% or better of the animals within their care. One of the programs then is the TNR program. So understanding that and high volume, low cost spay neuter is also part of that program. But that toolkit to me, that was like, oh, I understand how that fits in now. I understand how TNR works now. I understand that if we are successful at trap neuter return of community cats, that then really reduces the impact of the shelter. You're not getting a bunch of kittens if they're taking them into the kittens. So it it was one of those tools that you could pull out of your toolbox to really get at no kill for the shelter. And it's amazing that you work through trying to develop that. I don't know if you have your toolkit written out and if that's something that might be able to be shared with others, but I think I would be interested to see what those 11 programs um, that you've listed specifically are. And they're not mine. I would love to take credit for them, <laughs> but I, I, I don't think I should be doing that. They're actually called the No-Kill Equation. And okay. if anyone has uh, read Nathan Winograd's books or gone to his website, uh, you know, you will see that they're all laid out as to what the various programs are. Some are really obvious, you know, like offering medical assistance. Others are more something that shelters have never done or gotten involved with, which is really outreach to community and marketing kinds of things, programs like that. So tell me a little bit about the Michigan Pet Fund Alliance. You're one of the founders. When was it founded and who are the members and what's the purpose of the group? We were established in 2003 and that resulted because um, myself and several other people were uh, fostering for various uh, shelters within the area and I fostered puppies and as part of that should I own a dog or not kind of, you know, mm -hmm. effort that I was in. And what I found is that I was meeting people who who owned a marketing firm. I owned a planning firm. There were others that did. And I'm spending my days while I'm fostering puppies out of my home and working professionally, I'm spending time wiping up the floors <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, with bleach and doing things like that. And I'm like, you know, I have clients that are paying me good money to develop strategic plans and strategic approaches and and how to go forward with assisting in their efforts. And yet I'm wiping floors with bleach in the animal welfare world. Maybe I should be doing something that's more along my profession in helping the animal welfare world. And so myself and three other people got together first in conversations and said, maybe what we need to do is approach the shelters and say, you know, we can offer something at a different level than you normally have for volunteers. We're not cleaning cages and we're not doing more of the manual types of things, but we can help to develop 21st century practices for your organization. Uh, the first organization that we met with was not interested in our help. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but uh, I happened at that, I used to work in a municipality and they actually were getting a new shelter director who I had worked with, who was also a, an elected official at the time. And so I went to him and I said, you know, if you're ever interested in any volunteers that aren't at the clean the cage level, 
I'd gladly bring a group to you. And he was more than welcoming to us. And we worked for a particular county, one county, for several years in bringing best practices to them. And it was at that time then attending best friends conferences and the no-kill conferences and understanding what could be done, experienced within a shelter over time that actually my treasurer and I returned from a conference and we said, we need to go statewide. We shouldn't be helping just one municipality. We can be sharing what we learned, what we know, the different approaches on a statewide level. And that's when we actually changed our name, which, oh my goodness, that's probably about seven, eight years ago changed our name and went into a statewide approach. With the overall objective of providing uh, information to groups statewide? Yep, that's it. We, we, our mission is to stop the killing of healthy and treatable dogs and cats in Michigan shelters. We do that through training and educational and technical assistance and advocacy. And we host a conference, statewide conference, every other year. We offer technical assistance directly to any shelter that uh, wants our help. One of the advantages that we do have in Michigan that many of the other states do not have is that Every shelter in Michigan is required to submit a report annually on their intake of animals and then their disposition. So we took that raw data, which had been posted on websites and actually never used, and we started calculating off of every shelter's report, and we have approximately 188 shelters in the state started calculating what their performance was. It's like how many animals that you're taking in are actually being released alive? Or how many are you saving their lives? How many aren't? And when we started producing that report, a single report that listed all 180 shelters and their performance, it had a huge impact uh, within the state. And all of a sudden, people who knew about their shelter, didn't know about their shelter, liked their shelter, didn't like their shelter, who knows what their attitudes were, had a source, had an, a, a report where they could see how their tax dollars were being used or how their charitable contributions were being used for the homeless animals in their area. And I think that is one of the things we do annually. We produce that report. It's used widely and uh, has had a really significant impact within the state. So we have our conference. We have this report, which I said is very important. Uh, we offer technical assistance working with uh, shelters. And also we have a program that's called a rescue certification program. We noticed that uh, home-based rescues Really, in at least in Michigan, I think this is probably the case in most states, you'll have a home-based rescue. They will often become not-for-profit organizations. There's no oversight. There's no regulations. And it's kind of a Wild West operation in terms of how home-based rescues do operate. So we pulled together uh, experts throughout the state and said, let's develop a best practices handbook for home-based rescues, and we did that. We then launched a program, which is called a rescue certification program, so any home-based rescue can apply for a certification, and they also sign a code of ethics. And that was our approach for how do we get people operating at a higher level and an educated level as opposed to strictly an emotional level. So that's a program that we also operate that helped develop dialogues between the home-based rescue community and shelters. At the time, the home-based rescue community really saw shelters as the killers, mm -hmm. and the shelters saw the home-based rescues as the crazies. <laughs> right, so right. when you can 
up, you know, knowing that shelters are already regulated by the state, now you have others that want to operate at a professional level. And here's a handbook that tells you how it is that a professional level is to operate. Then you can start developing trust. And we have had huge success with that. And we also offer a grant program to those home-based rescues that will assist shelters in pulling animals that are at risk or hard to place, whether those are elderly animals or uh, animals with medical issues or behavior issues. And now let's take a moment to listen to a few words from our sponsors. Accidental Exiles by Bruce Perry. Jesse McAllister, a young Texan and a rock war vet, escapes to Europe where he seeks a new direction and to heal his desert wounds. Wandering the streets of Ascona, Switzerland, he meets and falls in love with a beautiful Italian waitress named Sonia Altarelli. Since the horrors of combat he encountered with a boyhood friend, Jesse will have nothing more to do with war. This story is his farewell to arms. Check out Accidental Exiles on Amazon.com today. Are you starting to think about that special holiday gift? Why not give the gift of a Community Cats podcast branded t-shirt, coffee mug, bag, or other item? This is the perfect way to spread the word about helping Community Cats. The proceeds from the sales will go to support the Community Cats podcast and the Community Cats Grants program, which helps small groups grow their fundraising programs to be able to fund more spay-neuter programs for free-roaming cats. Go to www.communitycatspodcast.com and click on our shop button in the menu bar today to get that perfect community cat gift right now. Thank you, everybody, for supporting the show. So you're covering information for the small group and the large group, and then hopefully they'll all come together at this annual conference? They do. They do. We have a good showing of uh, home-based rescue organizations, shelter staffing, animal control officers, animal advocates, and the public. And we actually just had our uh, conference uh, September 15th and 16th in the city of Flint. We had 300 people that attended. We were very fortunate to get some national sponsors. We had 12 sponsors. We had 28 vendors and 30-some sessions. So I think it went really well, a lot of information sharing. It's a great time to get people throughout the state connected. And I know I mostly talk about shelters because uh, or home-based rescues. That's our focus, our, the Michigan Pet Fund's focus. However, we also get In this particular conference, we had a pre-conference session where we actually had a hands-on workshop for trap, neuter, return. How do you, what do you do, how do you do it? And starting to connect people throughout the state for resources between one another. Excellent. That's great. Um, Having a training session focused on that. Being that you are a big picture person, and I'm also a big picture person, I love looking from the balcony down Mm -hmm. over things. Looking at Michigan, you've been involved, group's been around since 2003, and now we're at 2016, 2017, right around the corner. How have things changed for Community Cats since 2003? And then also tell me what you think is going to happen for Community Cats going forward. I think there's been a huge difference in what has happened for community cats because I mentioned before, you know, that the TNR, the looking at community cats is actually a tool within the toolkit for the shelters. When we first started, um, there were very, I honestly don't think there were any real focused community cat programs. There just weren't. We worked with that first county it, with a fabulously $100,000 grant from PetSmart Charities to start addressing it within the county. It then started happening that it's like, oh, if they're doing it, maybe we can do it. So we now have community cat programs throughout the state. And what has been very fortunate for us is that we also have nine low-cost, high-volume spay-neuter clinics throughout the state. And each one of them works with community cat groups. So they've been able to make it very affordable 
for those groups that are focused on the community cat effort. We actually have all about animals rescue. I don't know if you've had them on your show. Fabulous. Amber Sitko. Yep. We've had yes. Yes. Yep. yep. Uh, Amber, bless her heart. She was one of the first people that I tapped to do a uh, mash style spay neuter for uh, the community and uh, taught us how to do it in the first county that we were working at. They have been instrumental in uh, really providing large areas of the state with that high volume, low cost and teaching. Uh, they have a monthly session where they teach how to trap, neuter, return. So that has, and they've been teaching others. So to teach it. So it's been really instrumental in really rolling out across the state. What that means is that kitten intake, even though we do have what we call kitten season and we have too many kittens in the shelter at uh, spring and summer, it has dramatically been reduced. And of course, mm -hmm. complaints have dramatically been reduced too. And then I think it was two years ago, Dr. Julie Levy and uh, Dr. Kate Hurley launched the Million Cat Program. And that then started talking to shelters about not just the feral cats of trap, neuter, return them and put them back, but it helps shelter staff understand that if you have a cat that might be a friendly cat, that's a healthy cat that's living outdoors that you don't know who the owner is, there's a good possibility that that cat is dislocated. And you can bring it into the shelter where it's probably not going to be too happy and try to hope to reunite it with its owner and have a very low possibility of that happening. We just, returns for cats to their owner are very, very low in shelters. Or you can trap, neuter it, and return it to where it was with the hopes that it would find its owner. And what they found is well over 60%, and it varies, has in fact a good possibility of getting finding its owner. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So it's like, why bring a cat into a shelter and rehome it when it just may be lost? And what you can do is actually help it find its owner. So that has been very instrumental also in our sheltering. We've got shelters that are adopting the shelter neuter return programs. So what do I see for the future? Because right now we have, we, we have pockets of areas that are still non-believers right. of, of TNR and SNR, but they are diminishing quickly. They are finding they don't have a leg to stand on in their arguments, which I'm sure you've heard every single one, right? Can't yep. Disease, you know, <laughs> we need to get rid of them, take them one by one, whatever those crazy ideas that they have are, they're finding that nobody else is supporting them in the neighbors around them. So they're falling very quickly. So at some point in the near future, it sounds like you're looking at almost 100% coverage across the state. You know, we're darn close. We right now in our um, sheltering success. We, over a hundred of our shelters are at no kill now in the state of Michigan, and 54 out of 80 counties are at no kill. So they're doing 80% or better. And most no. of these areas all have community cap programs. Yep. Uh, the remaining counties and the remaining shelters there, we really have a handful of what I would consider our bad shelters or bad counties. The remaining ones are maybe at 80% or the high 70s in terms of their performance. So they're improving, and they're improving when they add those additional programs like the trap, neuter, return for ferals and the SNR programs, the shelter, neuter, return for the community cats. Well, Deborah, this has been fascinating, a very exciting conversation, and I haven't known much about what's been going on out in the Midwest, so it's been great for you to give a good perspective of what's happening in Michigan. If people are interested in finding out more about the Michigan Pet Fund Alliance or reaching out to you, how would they do that? 
probably the website is best, and you can go to michiganpetfund.org and find us. And, of course, we we tweet. We're on Facebook. <laughs> but <laughs> if you really want to find out about our programs or our approaches, it's there that you're going to find, you know, the presentations that were made at the conference. There you'll find the what we call the shelter reports, the annual shelter reports, the progress that we've made, and also the no-kill toolkit. Anything else you'd like to share with our listeners today? I think that it's kind of interesting because we are just off the conference. When we went to the first conference, we hosted our first conference, and we kind of gave, here's the state of. And at that time, when you looked at the statistics, we had a long way to go. (laughs) Mm. You walk out of a conference, you're pumped because you got people that think alike, that really want to make a change, that want to make a difference, and you hope that you're on the right path and, and that things are making progress. Just before this last conference... So this was our fourth conference. I'm reading on Facebook someone who had attended the first conference. And she posted on there, she said, you know, I went to this first conference, and I really didn't think that one person could make a difference. And when I walked out the door, I decided, I don't care. I'm going to set up a, a Facebook page for those homeless cats and dogs in the shelter actually in Genesee County. And Genesee County just was an absolutely horrible shelter. And here it was four conferences later, which is eight years later. Sorry about that, because we have every other year. I looked at that, and I went, oh, my goodness, Paula is responsible for that Facebook page. I never knew that. And we happened to be awarding Genesee County at this particular conference because they had improved so dramatically in the last year and a half. (laughs) It was just incredible the turnaround that they had. And it's like, you know what? One person can make a difference. It was Paula doing that one thing that she could do that moved not only what she was doing, but that whole county forward. And so if I had one last thing to say, that's what I would say, is that in this arena, one person can really move mountains and make a difference. Wow, that's a great story to end on, very impactful, and a testament to what technology can do. And as you say, one small action can move the needle and definitely in a different direction. Deborah, I want to thank you so much for being a guest on my show today, and I hope we'll have you on in the future. Would love it. Thank you for listening to the Community Cats podcast. I would really appreciate it if you would go to iTunes and leave a review of the show. It will help spread the word to help more community cats.